white Southerners had reason to be encouraged. They had an ally in the White House. President Andrew Johnson was a Union man, but his roots were in the South. Andrew Johnson was a classic East Tennessee politician. As they used to say in Tennessee, uh, old Andy never went back on his raisin, which meant Andrew Johnson was always a person who was from where he was from. This is a country for white men, Johnson reportedly declared. And by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. Johnson began pardoning former Confederates. He then helped them set up white-run governments in the South. The notion on the part of even the most advanced thinking white Southerners that somehow black people should simply be treated like white people was alien. They couldn't make that leap. Grant had not begun life as a friend of the black man, but during the war, he had come to believe that blacks were due the same rights as every other American. Grant had never been an abolitionist. He quite openly, at times, rejected notions of social equality, but there is no question that Grant believed that those liberties created by the war for African Americans had to be enforced the same as any other Americans. By the fall of 1866, the northern press was drenched with tales of southern bloodshed. Many placed the blame for the violence squarely at the feet of Andrew Johnson. Worried about the midterm elections, Johnson forced the popular Grant to accompany him on a speaking tour. Huge crowds turned up all along the route. They were there to see Grant, not Johnson. In city after city, the general stood by in silence as the combative Johnson spoke and the crowd grew hostile, hurling insults at the president. Grant had always hated the discord and infighting of politics. Now the strain of the trip began to take its toll. As the caravan made its way from Buffalo to Cleveland, Grant uh, visited a refreshment car, began drinking, in fact had to be coaxed to lie down in a baggage car. And by the time the expedition arrived at Cleveland, Johnson had to explain to the crowd that the general was indisposed, unavailable for public viewing. Grant confided in a letter to Julia that he found the president's angry speeches a national disgrace, but he warned her that she must not show the letter to anyone. Publicly, he still had to look obedient to the president, his superior, the commander in chief, but privately, he began to dissent more and more from Johnson's policies and to make clear to others that he disagreed with Johnson's preferred path to peace and reconciliation. In the spring of 1867, Washington was a city filled with intrigue and split into two warring factions. On one side was President Andrew Johnson, the defender of Southern whites. On the other side were the so-called radical Republicans who controlled Congress, led by the crusading senator from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner. The radicals saw former Confederates as traitors and freed slaves as the ones who needed defending. The relationship between Andrew Johnson and Congress could be described in a single word, vicious. They hated him, he hated them. After months of bitter infighting, the radicals declared war on Andrew Johnson. 
they threw out his white-ruled governments and set up free elections that gave blacks political power. Black men would soon be able to vote by the thousands, electing black sheriffs, mayors, and state legislators. The very idea of black people on the floor of the House and the Senate and the various state legislatures to most white Southerners was just a kind of constant galling outrage. It was a galling outrage to Andrew Johnson as well. He had fought every move Congress made toward black equality in the South. When Congress passed a Civil Rights Act to protect Southern blacks, Johnson vetoed it. When Congress passed the 14th Amendment, granting blacks equal protection under the law, Johnson encouraged Southerners to reject it. Finally, in February 1868, Andrew Johnson became the first president in American history to be impeached. He would survive his trial by a single vote, but his presidency was effectively dead. On May 21st, 1868, the Republicans gathered at Crosby's Opera House in Chicago to choose a new candidate for president. A single name was placed in nomination, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant, as the former general, the soldier who wins the war, was the figure who could unify. He was the general at the helm that had saved the Union. And after all, what did the Republican Party represent? What did the Republican Party exist for? But to save the Union, and now also the, the destruction of slavery, and its aftermath, which was a Reconstruction policy, like it or not, uh, that was in place on the ground in the South. There were so many people who were concerned only about themselves. There was so much posturing, there was so much despair. Gradually, people just sort of realized, well, you know, who do you trust? Who hasn't lied to us? Who said, I'm going there and went there? And that was Grant. Gradually, people realized, you know, leadership is not easy to come by. 8 days later, at his house in Washington, Grant formally accepted his party's nomination for the presidency of the United States. Why did he accept the nomination? I think he identified himself with the Union victory in the war. He was responsible for making sure that that victory had an integrity. And while he had ambitions and he had vanities like any other man, he was in a special position in this, in this country. And he felt that if it were left to politicians, they would botch it. Look what they'd done. <laughs> Look what they'd done since Lincoln's assassination. Grant and Julia went back home to Galena to wait out the campaign. Publicly, Grant kept apart from politics. He made no speeches. But every day he walked downtown and carefully read the reports that came in from around the country. The campaign offered a glimpse of what lay in store for the next president. The Democrats, led by candidate Horatio Seymour, based their strategy, as one politician put it, on the aversion with which the masses contemplate the equality of the Negro. Many whites in the North, as well as the South, sided with the Democrats promising a renewed battle over Reconstruction. Grant's campaign slogan called for an end to the conflict. 
It was a stroke of political genius. Let us have peace. It means so many things, and therein lies its power. Let's have peace between North and South. Let's have peace between Black and White. Let's have an end to Reconstruction so the nation can move on and enjoy the post-war prosperity that people so ardently desire. I suspect to Grant he had hoped that it might mean a little bit of all of those things. Um, Grant, uh, I think, had an agenda, though, um, uh, of conciliation. Uh, he did want to see his presidency uh, and his use of, of presidential power, at least, as a means to uh, a, an as yet unachieved uh, and unthought through um, national reconciliation. Grant saw his administration as wrapping up the issues of the war, as basically a placeholder administration, that Reconstruction would be brought to a speedy, easy end without the conflicts of the Johnson years and the country could move on. But Reconstruction would not be the only challenge looming before the new president. He had taken office at a moment of volcanic change. Here's the kind of country Grant inherits. The country is being catapulted. It's catapulting itself into another age. It's becoming a high-change industrial society. This industrial engine is, is roaring. And it, it's an age when the country's flush. But at the same time, you have a tremendous territorial expansion taking place. Territorial expansion meant the first transcontinental railroad joining the Atlantic to the Pacific, followed by settlers moving west, hungry for opportunity. In the path of this juggernaut stood the original occupants of this land, as Grant called them, pushed farther and farther west in a bloody war with the U.S. Army. Grant's close friend, General William Tecumseh Sherman, now head of the Army, believed the Indians stood in the way of progress and would have to be exterminated. Sherman has this almost racial view of American democracy that Anglo-Saxon peoples have a right to take and conquer the rest of this country, that it's ours. And he thinks to himself, this is a fact of life. We have the steel mill, we have the locomotive, we have the telegraph. These are weapons of civilization. This is how the West is going to be settled. You can't stop it. The summer before Grant's election, Sherman had accompanied Grant and his two older sons, Fred and Buck, on a trip out west. Grant saw what was happening to the Indians and their territory. This will probably be the last chance I will ever have to visit the plains, he wrote Julia. It will be something for Buck, too, to know that he had traveled on the plains while still occupied by the buffalo and the Indian both rapidly disappearing now. Grant wanted to make peace with the Indians and settle them on reservations as citizens and Christians. We would instruct you in raising stock, he told Red Cloud, a chief of the Sioux. Your children would learn to read and write the English language, the same as white people. In this way, you would be prepared before the game is gone to live comfortably and securely. Sherman and many others disagreed with the president's Indian policy, but Grant was adamant. When I said, let us have peace, I meant it, he later told a reporter. I want peace on the plains as everywhere else. Julia Grant was now happily in command of a sizable White House staff and thriving at the center of social life in Washington. Well, I think the White House for Julia was the way she would have liked to have had 
her home in St. Louis, organized and run. You know, I mean, she was the planter's daughter, but he never had the wealth, the kind of wealth and splendor that, that most of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the top grade, in a sense, the more powerful planters in the South had had. And here was a return to that unfulfilled dream, to that kind of life that she had had a little bit of a taste of before the Civil War. At first, Grant resisted Julia's efforts to get him into an evening suit, preferring his familiar rumpled clothes. But he soon got the hang of a white tie and even began to enjoy the parties. It's fascinating to watch Grant, a creation of the early 19th century, pass on over into that second half. Because he's very much a, a boy of the frontier, of the west, uh, of all those forests and rivers. He is not entirely at ease in the second half of it, but he wanted to be. He tried to fit in. At Julia's lavish dinner parties at the White House, he found he was powerfully drawn to America's new breed of heroes, the titans who were driving the country's industrial machine and indulging their appetites for high living and big spending. Here was a kid who all his life had this gnawing sense of financial insecurity. He saw these men, they were like generals, commanding generals of capitalist enterprises. They ran large enterprises. They liked to be left alone. They were self-reliant. They commanded men. They commanded resources. He had a lot of admiration for that type of person. They smoked cigars. Military uniforms had kept the sides straight on the battlefield. But in Grant's new world of suits and ties, it was not so easy to tell friends from enemies. Perhaps the most infamous of the new tycoons was Jay Gould, known in the financial world as the Mephistopheles of Wall Street. His partner, the flamboyant Jim Fisk, had begun his business life smuggling cotton during the war. Grant's new friends, Gould and Fisk, hatched a scheme to manipulate the president to make a fortune speculating on gold. First, they found a way to insinuate themselves into Grant's inner circle. Grant had a sister who had gone for a long time without getting married. And finally, finally, a very elderly, able R. Corbin had snatched up this uh, fading flower and made her his wife. There was an enormous gratitude on the part of the Grants for this uh, long-delayed marriage, and it gave Corbin an opportunity to uh, bring into the White House circle his unsavory companions, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. All through the summer of 1869, Fisk and Gould courted Grant at lavish dinners, on posh yachts, and at the opera. At the same time, they bought up as much gold as they could cornering the market. The trusting Grant was unaware of their scheme. As summer turned into fall, gold prices rose to record highs. From across the country, pressure on Grant mounted to release government gold and push the prices down. In the midst of all this, the Grants are on a little vacation trip out to Washington, Pennsylvania. And one day, Grant and uh, Horace Porter, I believe, were, were out playing croquet. Uh, along comes the messenger with a letter. Gould wanted to make sure Grant kept gold off the market. He got Corbin to write the president an urgent letter. It was a mistake. It takes a while for Grant to wake up to this, but it's got to be something important if the letter is being sent by a courier uh, who's waiting for an answer and so on. And at last, he smells a rat. On Friday, September 24th, Grant ordered the Treasury to sell $4 million in gold, sending the price plummeting. 
Panic reigned on the New York Stock Exchange. One man was yelling, shoot me, shoot me, until he was finally led away. It was called Black Friday. Most Americans refused to believe that Grant was involved in the conspiracy. But in the drawing rooms of the Capitol, there was talk that the president was, as Henry Adams put it, a dunce. I think it was a character flaw, perhaps, that he was taken by wealth and power, being a powerful man himself, a powerful man who had no understanding of how wealth was generated. He did have a tendency to think that people were as straight ahead as he was. And it wasn't that he wouldn't think ill of anybody. He thought ill of a lot of people and would say so in subtle ways. But sneakiness just didn't, it didn't enter into his, his consciousness. It wasn't on his radar screen. Just six months after the inauguration, the image of Grant, the incomparable hero, competed with Grant, the corruptible dummy. <laughs> 